Welcome. So glad that you are here. If you are in the live service or if you are in the communion service, either way, welcome. So glad. We're continuing on in this study of a fascinating man's life called Moses. And so why don't you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. If you need a Bible, wave at an usher. They'll be glad to let you borrow one and you can keep it. It's our gift to you if you need a Bible. Exodus 13. If you're new to the Bible, that's just the second book in the whole Bible. So you just go past Genesis and you're there. Exodus 13. While you're turning, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard someone say, or maybe have you ever said something like this? God will never give you more than you can handle. You ever heard that before? Sounds reassuring and it sounds hope giving and you tend to hear it when somebody's having a really bad day or a really bad season, like maybe your job is just becoming all consuming and you feel like you can hardly keep your head above water. And speaking of water, you just discover that you've got a leak in your roof that needs patching up. And two of your kids need to be delivered at the same time in two different directions for different activities. And your third child is feeling a little bit of a sore throat coming on. The one whose teacher also sent home a note and said, we really need to schedule a time to get together and talk. And about then, you'd like to crawl into bed yourself, but you can't because your mom just told you that she has some medical issues now that are going to need some attention. And your spouse is going to be out of town the next four nights. And your head is spinning. And if you could check yourself into a padded room, you would, but you can't. And then a friend sends you a text. Remember, God will never give you more than you can handle. But you really wonder because you already feel like he already did. I already have a lot more than I can handle. Well, that's exactly how Moses was feeling when we find him in our passage today in Exodus chapter 13. So after 40 years on the backside of the Midian desert, he's gone to Egypt at God's instruction and he has said to the Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh was hard-hearted and caused Egypt to move into a series of 10 plagues that God had to bring upon Egypt. Each of those plagues exposing the feebleness of various Egyptian deities, like the God of the Nile, and the God of the sun, Amun-Re, and the God of the frogs, until finally on the night of the 10th plague, the Pharaoh had had enough. When the Egyptian firstborn sons were claimed by the angel of death, he said to Moses, get out, take your people, and go. And finally, the Israelites, God's chosen people, they were off and rolling for a few days at least. Now, when you look at the map, you can see it would have looked like a journey of just several hundred miles from Egypt to the promised land, right? You would just go uh, along the southern border uh, boundary of the, the Mediterranean Sea, and you would get uh, right there. But <clears throat> God knew that's not going to be the route you can take because they would have had to face battles along the way, and he knew God did. You're not even remotely trained yet uh, for battles. You, you've just been follow, following Moses for a few days at this point. So God makes a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day to lead them. And he says, people, here we go. We're moving to the promised land. Go south. And that made very little sense to anybody who was any good with maps but that's where the pillar of God was leading. And so they went. Now, let's pick it up with that background in verse 17 of chapter 13. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. And so God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. Go to chapter 14, verse 3. Pharaoh will think 
the Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. So I'll harden Pharaoh's heart and he'll pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. Your honor, if you didn't notice, you just said farewell to several million slaves. Your whole workforce has left. So he had a change of mind. He had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of his best chariots, along with the other chariots of Egypt, with the officers over all of them. The Egyptians, this is verse uh, nine, the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Why? Well, trapped by the Red Sea on one side of them and the Egyptians barreling towards them on the back side, they knew that God had just given them way more than they could handle. Even the most pro-Moses supporters were melting down in fear now and switching their votes from thumbs up to thumbs down on Moses, which begs the question, why? Why would God have given them more than they could handle? More importantly, for our purposes, why would he give you and me more than we could handle? I'll give you three reasons that we see in the text today. If you're a note taker, here's the first one. Because real character is only forged when we come to the end of ourselves. Real character is only forged when we come to the end of ourselves. Inner character and fortitude, it's never built until we've run out of our own resources. And the Israelites had none of it yet. God had to build that into them. So a while back, a friend of mine with more athletic acumen than I, having watched my then fifth grader uh, playing football, said, you should invest a little bit in him and sign him up for this group training over at such and such place. And so I went over and I signed him up and I told my son William about it. And he said, oh, that sounds great. And so we drove over several days later for the first um, session uh, that evening. And, and, and as we pulled into the parking lot, all that we could see was no fifth graders, only eighth and ninth and 10th, 11th and 12th graders. Some with their shirts off, accentuating their muscles glistening in sweat and my son looked through the windshield with his eyes big as donuts and said um dad there is a group for the younger guys right i said i don't know about that but don't worry i'm not going to leave i've got my chair in the trunk and i'll just stick around the whole time well several minutes later he was out with those guys throwing pass right routes to high schoolers decisively bigger and quicker than he'd ever worked with, but he was hitting them in stride. And when we left about nine, 90 minutes later, <clears throat> he was just euphoric. He said, when we got to the car, that was awesome. When do I get to go again? I said, well, we get to go again tomorrow if you want. So we went back the next day. It was another good experience. And the next and the next. And finally, several days later, I think it was a week or two beyond that, uh, one evening, the receivers, they were running sloppy routes and they were dropping every ball that was coming their ways. And the coach, I could tell the coach was irritated. And finally the coach got triggered and he said, get your butts on this line, all of you. I want full gassers. You're running to that line, touch the line, come back, touch this line, run back to that line, touch that line, run to this line. And do it within this many seconds, go. And they took off. From the sideline, I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe I shouldn't have paid for the whole month up front. <laughs> they finished, and after a minute or so rest, the coach said, 
Light up again. You're not done. Do it again. So they did another gather. They rested. And then another. And then another. The coach did never cheer up. <laughs> and, and finally, the boys, <laughs> they were lying about on the field grass, gasping for air. At, at which point he said, get up, go get water, and get your blanks off this field, and don't you come back unless you plan to work. Well, I gulped and packed up my chair quietly as I could, hoping he wouldn't spot me and tell me to go do a gasser on the way out. <clears throat> and my son met me at the car, and we slithered into our car, and we drove off in silence. And not for about a mile or so down the road till I was pretty confident that we were beyond the coach's chariot's ability to catch us. <laughs> I broke the silence, and I said, well, what you th thinking now? And I was ready for him to say, I think I'm done with that, which wouldn't have bothered me. You have to understand, I'm not an athlete, never was. So in our family, sports has always been a get to, never a have to. I said, so what was you thinking? He said, well, it was hard, but you just got to do it. Um. Uh, Technically, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Son, you don't have to put up with that. I was starting to say, but thought wiser of it. And so I said, huh. Well, then, son, I'm really proud of you. Because you just persevered, and that was not easy. But you hung in with those older guys. And you did it. And that's a really important lesson. Because sometimes life is hard. But you just got to do it. Someday, son, <laughs> you may have a problem in, in marriage or a problem with one of your children. You might have something that's proving really difficult or maybe at the job place. Maybe your job will someday be really feeling impossible to you or you might even get a diagnosis someday that seems very unfair. But people with character don't quit. And character can't be built until we've been pushed past our breaking point because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. In one of his books, Gary Thomas observes that most Christians nowadays, certainly in America, American Christians, pray only for relief or for comfort or for healing, which are great when they come. But what if relief or comfort or healing don't come? Then what? Then we need to pray with the Apostle Paul what he prayed to the Col for the Colossians. That we would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we might have great endurance and patience. Because in the same way that biceps won't ever be developed by curling one pound weights, our inner character will never grow until God puts us into situations beyond our natural strengths. You can search the whole Bible. You'll never find a single episode of any person who just got to go instantly from the bench on the sideline onto the playing field, playing a significant role for God. No, all the greats, they had to go through the crucible of sanctification. They had to get worked over by God before he could put them in and use them for his great purposes. Nobody comes with character that is ready made to fill the shoes that he has in mind for us to wear. That takes time in the desert where ourselves are broken down and where our character is built up. 
So with the Egyptian army bearing down behind them in an impassable Red Sea in front of them, panic inside them all. Verse 11, they said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, just leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. What was God doing? Why was he taking them to where they were pinned? And why might he be allowing you into a situation that feels impossible? Second reason, to deepen your faith. To deepen your faith. At first reading, when you first come to this story, you, 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 you read and you go, you Israelites, man. You, seriously? You're ready to surrender that quickly and just march back to Egypt as slaves? What, just a few weeks earlier, you had front row seats you watched one plague and two and three and four you watched 10 plagues pass through Egypt the severity of which you were protected from if you don't remember you the chosen people and now God has given you a divine pillar of cloud by day and fire by night the rest of us we longingly and jokingly say, oh, if only God would give me a sign in the sky, then I'd know which way to, you actually got one. And so you of all people, why are you cutting and running now? So the pillar has led you here. But you of all people should be opening up your chairs, propping up your feet and getting out the popcorn and say, boy, this is looking really bad. But, our great God, who brought us out with 10 plagues, I'm sure he's got an 11th plague up his sleeve, and it's about to happen. Pull up a chair. This is going to be good. But they lost their perspective. They're panicking. They're giving up. They should just take us back as slaves. What's wrong with those Israelites? I'll tell you what's wrong. The same thing that's wrong with you and me. Our faith is always flimsier than we wish and always therefore needs deepening. That's how it was for the seven, several dozen of us who were working feverishly to get this church started 20 years ago. We'd identified the club intermediate school as the perfect spot, the perfect location. I'd even met with the principal and we liked each other. He said, yeah, I'm, I feel great about you using our school. And everything was moving along swimmingly until I got up to the Klein ISD building and ended up sitting down with the assistant superintendent, Dr. Lemon. And after he listened to, listened to my impassioned speech, he shook his head and explained, Reverend Werlein, our district's policy doesn't permit us to rent our schools out to churches that don't own property in the district yet. And we owned no property. Providing the airtight logic, in my opinion, I said, but Dr. Lemon, how will I ever get up a crowd who could raise some offerings to buy some property in your district if you don't let me in your school before I own property. See? <laughs> he shrugged and said, I'm sorry. Uh, this is just our policy. He put his arm around me and he walked me out to the hallway. I was so discouraged. I got my car on the west side of the parking lot of that building, put my hands on the wheel, and I was disillusioned and des despairing. And I was, I was desperate at this point. What are we going to do? I said, God, I thought that we were on the same team here. I thought you were in this with us. After all, we are starting this church to help people get to know you. We're kind of working for you. So why did you let the door just close? And what do I do now? Well, the next Sunday, I gathered up with the several dozen that were our core group of faith bridgers in the home that we were meeting in. 
And I told, told him the whole story. And I said, hey, um, bad news is I got, I got nothing. I don't know what else we can really do. I said, but I have read about people who had big prayers and they prayed for big things and they saw God work in big ways. So maybe he just wants us to pray a big prayer and see him work. I wasn't even sure I believed it when I was saying it, but it's not like I had a lot of other choices. So I said, let's go to our knees. And we prayed, God, if you won't, it won't. But if you would, it could. And we prayed it one week, and we prayed it two, and we prayed it a third week and four, and we went about seven or eight weeks. Each week they were saying, have we heard it? No, <laughs> nothing yet. But after about eight weeks of this, a lady came to our group that Sunday for the first and only time. And after the group was over, she called, and she said, you know, the superintendent of the client ISD, Dr. Collins, yes. Well, he's my next door neighbor. He said, I'll reach out to him for you. And thanks for the meeting tonight. I, I, uh, I don't think it's going to be for me, but I had a good time visiting your group, and, and I think your, your, your new church is going to turn out great. Well, she kept her word clearly because the next night on my voice machine was a message for Dr. Collins. And his voice was saying, Reverend Werlein, I was talking to my neighbor, um, and she was telling him about your, your new church. And, and I was wondering, could, would you come over tomorrow, and I'd like to just talk with you in person about it, see if we can find a way to help you get your new church started. And I was doing cartwheels across the living room floor, proverbially speaking. I did go to his office the next day, and within 20 minutes, I walked out of there with permission. He said, Reverend Werlein, I, I think we can, I think we can grant you an exemption in this instance. We'll go ahead and rent the school to you, even though you, you don't have your property yet. And I'm telling you, those of us who were part of that, we never forgot that. That sort of thing leaves a little bit of a mark. And you find yourself saying, you know, I think this prayer thing does work. I think God was in this. And for months, we marveled to think that God had heard our prayers in such detail that of all the thousands of people in Northwest Houston who God could have tapped to come visit our group at one time, he graciously tapped the one lady who lived next door to Dr. Collins superintendent of the whole district and he brought her that day just once but just enough for her to be the conduit that we needed why does God lead us in directions that we don't understand because sometimes the only way our faith will grow friends is if we're cornered with an uncrossable Red Sea before us and an encroaching army of impossibilities bearing down behind us. And so what do we do? Well, we do what Moses told his people to do in that moment. You see it in verse 13, he says, don't be afraid, stand firm and watch what God does. So all night, God brought winds that would blow. And when the sun rose the next morning, they looked out and before them was a path through the sea. And they walked upon that dry ground to the other side. And when the Egyptian horsemen came charging in after them, God closed it up and it collapses upon their enemies, which leads to the third and final reason for today as to why God gives us more that we can handle on our own. It's for this, to show his hand to others that they might see and be saved. Look at verse 31. 
When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And remember, it wasn't just the people who went through the Red Sea on dry ground that came to saving faith because of this episode. No, no, no. This story was and still is arguably the most well-worn passage in the whole Old Testament, at least until you get several hundred years further along and you find a young shepherd boy, David, who goes out and slays a giant named Goliath. This account, the story of what happens in this Red Sea moment, this story just ricochets, just, 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 like dominoes spread throughout the Mediterranean people. We know because scripture tells us other people heard of it. We even read, in fact, we'll get there in about a month. We even read of a prostitute in Jericho who when she heard about it, she said, I'll just be on his side. Whatever their God is, that is the one true God. Sign me up for that God. Others who weren't even of Jewish descent when they were hearing this story, they said, I want to follow that. that one true, that's the one true God. I'm in for him. I believe. And friends, the news of God's saving power has always spread through the convincing story of lives personally touched and transformed by his power and grace. That's always how it's shared and how it's worked. But I have to say something, uh, friends, now uh, here at church. I'm concerned that we Christians in America, we're not telling the story of our rescuing God, not in a way which is inspiring other people to sign up, to say, I want to know that God, I believe, because I've been watching your life and I can see. So I've been asking, why is this? I think for one thing, it's because many professing believers have swallowed unbiblical theology with, with platitudes like God will never give you more than you can handle. Which, by the way, let me just anticipate. Some of you are running, I know there is a verse that says he won't give us something. Yes, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The verse you're trying to bring up is a verse about temptation. He says he'll never let you be tempted like into sin. But what he doesn't give you a way out. That has to do with maybe I shouldn't take the drink after all. That has to do with maybe I should turn the computer off because he's giving me a way out. It has to do with temptation, not with the sorts of things that, that most of us go around using that platitudinal type of thinking about. He, he, he says very clearly, no, 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 no. That's a temptation thing. That's not what you're talking about. And I'll tell you why unbiblical doctrine is dangerous and destructive then to your, your faith and your witness. Because here's what happens next. If you swallow that sort of doctrine, then you hit a rough patch in life and you'll look up at God and you'll say, wait a second. What's wrong with you, God? I thought we're on the same team. I mean, I'm keeping my end of the deal. I tell people more or less, I'm a believer. And I thought when I signed up to follow you, my life was going to get better. Isn't this supposed to be my best life now? Um, no, that's called heaven. That's where you get your best life now. But we're never promised that on this side, never in God's word. We're not, we're promised a cross to carry that others might see and be inspired and drawn to it that they too might believe. We're given the message of a God who, though without sin himself, looked upon all of us full of sin and instead of saying to hell with them all, he said, I love them all. So much so that he sent his only son, Jesus, who would come into this world to live the, the life of sinlessness that you and I never could live. 
so that he could die the death of punishment that you and I all deserved, so that he could conquer the grave that we would never have the hope of conquering, to the end that whosoever would believe in him might have life and life everlasting. But that's not the message that's getting out. Many professing Christians nowadays are going around with a flimsy, superficial doctrine to match their unformed souls. And people aren't inspired. They're not being drawn into it. And further diminishing in our impact, too many Christians' political identities are now overpowering their identities as followers of Christ. And believers are more, so many believers are, are more into politics than they're, than they're into Jesus. But the answers to life's questions, friends, have never been found in politics, not in the days of Pharaoh, not in the days of Moses, and not today, in the days of President Trump or President Biden or Warren or Sanders or Harris or whoever. So where is the believers today in America who would subjugate their political leanings to their identities as followers of Jesus. Where are the believers who would climb out of the mud pit of social media posting that is calling this side or that side or the next side? Those people are utterly stupid. When many times this side or that side or the next is full of people who also call themselves Christians. No wonder the skeptical world looks at us and says, yeah, don't see any difference in their life with the rest. I don't think whatever, Lord, they say they are. It doesn't seem to be doing anything inside of them. I don't think I need it. No wonder people aren't saying, I want to be a follower. But since I brought up candidates, I might should mention there is a candidate who gets it right. Who gets the economy right, who gets abortion right, who gets immigration and gun control and environmental issues and national defense and national security, and who keeps a perfect tone. Never foul, never vitriolic, always uplifting and hope giving. And his name is Jesus. And if you've taken him as your savior friend, don't forget, you signed on to be a part of his kingdom. And that kingdom rises above all of the world's earthly kingdoms. Even the greatest of early Christians, they understood this. See, the early Christians, they got this. And, and, and just imagine if those earliest Christians, the first 300 years of Christian history, if they'd tried to saddle up to the Roman government, we'd have never heard of Jesus. They'd have sold their souls so quickly into the Roman, we, would have, we wouldn't even be here today. But they didn't do that. They stood apart from that and they were distinct and they let their lights shine and they were real and compelling and loving and earthy and caring and transformational. And that's why people said, I gotta have whatever's inside of him. I need what's inside of her. Jesus, I'll have Jesus because I've watched your life and you have a hope and a distinctly different outlook than the rest of the world. Like Polycarp. Polycarp was, was the bishop of Smyrna in 155 AD when the enemies of Christ were killing believers. And the authorities finally came to arrest 86-year-old Polycarp. And after greeting them, the guards who came to get him, he said, gentlemen, I'll go with you not protesting, but first let us serve you a meal. And they did. And as the guards were eating, they're saying, why are we arresting this guy? And he did go with them. And at his sentencing, he was told, deny Christ and we will let you live. Just say Caesar is Lord, not Jesus is Lord. To which Polycarp said, for 86 years, he's been faithful to me. He's never done me any wrong. How could I deny or blaspheme the king who has saved me? They said, because we're going to burn you at the stake. He said, then so be it. And as they were preparing to fasten him to the stake, he told them, you can leave me as I am. 
For he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle. You don't have to fasten me to the stake. And before the flame was lit, he looked up to heaven and he prayed, Lord God, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be sharing in the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice for you. I bless you and glorify you now and forever. And then they lit the flame and he burned. And you know what happened after that? The skeptical unbelievers who were watching and saw it, as well as people who didn't get to see it but heard about it, they signed up. They said, I want whatever Polycarp had inside of him. It's Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life. I want the same spirit that was giving him that power to live inside of me and transform me. They said, I want that same Christ. And they would say it today as well if they were seeing it in our lives. Did God give Polycarp more than Polycarp could handle? Yes. Certainly at the end he did. So why would he give you, me, more than we could handle three reasons to forge our character to deepen our faith and trust in his power and to turn our lives into lights that are shining brightly so that others might see him and say that's who I want to follow I want to know your Lord Jesus and so God will still give all of us more than we can handle. He gave more to Moses than he could handle, to the Israelites than he could handle, they could handle, and Polycarp than he could handle. But notice this too. God never gave any of them more than God could handle. And brothers or sisters, God will never give you more than God can handle when he's working in you. So put your eyes on him, put your trust in him, cling to him and live for his glory. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the scriptures that even though they're 3,000 and more years old, this section that we were looking at at least, it's so, still so relevant. It has such applicational value for our living. Lord, forgive us, many of us, all of us, for the superficiality into which we've given ourselves and even this sort of errant doctrine which then puts us at odds with you and we start thinking, oh, God doesn't really love me and I don't know if I really believe. It's because we had the wrong understanding from the get-go. I pray, God, that you put character into us and that you deepen our faith and that you would turn us into transformational agents because the world needs some transformational Christians nowadays. Lord, I pray that you would put that sort of transformation into our souls that others would see and want to believe and give their lives to you, Jesus. I pray, God, for any who are here today in either room who maybe they just came in here and today is their first time or their second time or maybe many more times than that, but they, if they are honest, would say, I've never really said yes to Jesus in the first place. I've never really opened up my heart to him. I pray that even in this moment, sir or ma'am if that's you that you would say in the quietness of this moment Jesus I'm asking you to come into to my life forgive me of the sins that I've committed cleanse me from all unrighteousness 
Empower me with the fullness of your spirit and teach me what it means to follow after you because I want to live for the praise of your glory. And we pray all of these things in your strong name, Jesus. Amen.